Wow. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, yesterday morning, we had 15,000 of these tiny little things out all over, all over the churchyard. A simple plastic little egg filled with candy, and this thing can generate a stampeded herd of kids that can pick up 15,000 eggs in less than two minutes. It's the craziest thing you've ever seen. But it really got me thinking, like thinking about this. How could I get adults to be as excited about the gospel on Sunday as kids are on Saturday morning for these plastic little eggs? Maybe, maybe the message of the gospel is all about packaging. This is a simple little package, little, little green plastic egg, and inside it's all these good things. Do we make the gospel sometimes too hard to understand? I don't know. Do we make the good news, which gospel means, just meh and a little bit boring? I can remember when I was going to church as a young kid on Easter. I went because I had to, if you know what I mean. I went because I had to. And much of what I listened to, I can remember, was rather mysterious. Often, I was listening to a very serious man in a pious tone talk about things I really had no idea what he's talking about. Very big words. Often, as a kid, there was no leader in the church who just really made it appealing. I just wanted to be explained, what's all the excitement? Why is everybody so excited? Remember, everybody would wear their new Easter dresses and bonnets, and I always had to wear this Jacket with a scratchy sweater. Mom, why do I got to wear this scratchy sweater? Why is this day different than other days? And then after service was over, life was just how it was before. Nothing really changed, you know. And then later as a younger adult, about 20 years old, I just wanted somebody to give me a reason why I should follow a God I can't see. Just give it to me straight. Somebody give it to me straight. And this got me thinking about this egg. Maybe today I should just give it to you straight. So here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to package it in a very easy form. So the title of this is Easter, <laughs> Easter in an Eggshell. And what I mean, inside of this egg, I am going to show you why Christianity is so good. And why it's the best life ever. Inside of this egg are four answers to four questions I think it's on everybody's heart. The first question is this, is what is the purpose of my life? Why am I in this earth? What does God want for me? Inside this egg is the answer. Inside this egg is the second question I think we all wonder, am I invited? Is this for me or is this just for a special group of people? You know, guys that wear suits and ties, that's why I wore this today, you know? Or is this for anybody? Who's invited? That's the second question. Third question is, all right, what, what's, what's the deal? What's the cost? If proverbial, I'm at the pearly gates, what do I need to do to get in? How much? And then there's always that haunting question, actually, which Hatcher brought up there. What about death? What do we do with that? Because that seems to cancel the whole thing. Is that it? So those are the four main things we're going to answer. So to do this, I first have to open up this egg and see what's inside. The first thing I have here is I have this nice little blue Bible. Because in this little blue Bible, I have the verse that's just like this egg. It's a compact little verse, one verse, but inside that one verse is the answer to all four of these questions. And if you can open up your Bibles, if you have them, it's okay, I got, a ver I got the verse up here. But it's John chapter 6, verse 40. And here's what it says. For my Father's will, here's what Dad wants. That's what that means. My Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. And I will raise them up on the last day. It's really a very simple verse, actually. It's as easy as you can get. G.K. Chesterton, the old Catholic theologian, once said, 
He said, basically, the Christian gospel has not been tried and found wanting. It just has been found difficult and left untried. Or you could say it like this. Christianity is not hard to understand. People simply don't try to understand it. That's the problem. So, the verse begins with my Father's will. And when it, when it comes to the Christian message, when it comes to prayer, when it comes to a future we are to look forward to, it, it doesn't involve primarily a mean, angry tyrant who just wants to rule your life. It's my Father, His will, what He wants for us. It's Jesus' dad. And there's no better dad than Jesus' dad. In fact, I believe inside of every one of us, we have this deep desire, it's been implanted in us, to please our father. Even if we're not getting along with him, we just want dad to say, I'm pleased with you, son. I'm pleased with you, daughter. And so what this is, is this is how, what the eternal father wants from us. And you could say, what does God want for you specifically? Why are you on this earth? And right in the middle of that verse, it's very clear. He wants one thing. He wants to live with us forever. He wants you to have eternal life. He wants us to be with him forever. But before I talk about the wonder and beauty of eternal life, I remember I was working this out with one of the other pastors, Will Snyder, this week. And um, I just asked him the question, why does this concept of eternal life, it just doesn't seem compelling to people? Like, why don't people run for it like kids run for a little teeny, a little baby Easter egg? Why don't people hunger after this? And I think because they have three misconceptions about eternal life. Number one, I think people think eternal life is going to be boring. We're going to be, you've heard, of floating on clouds, playing a harp, broom. Blum, singing songs with vibrato, very encouraging song. Trust and obey. Boy, that's exciting. There's no other way. Is that I'm going to be doing for all eternity? And so it's, it's not compelling. And that's false. Did you know that's not what eternity is going to be? Second reason, I think, is because people, by nature, we live out of sight, out of mind. God right now is, but he's invisible. His spirit, his presence is with us, but I don't see him. I want to see him. And then Jesus, who is in the body, human body, is waiting to come back someday. But man, he's taking a long time. Don't you get tired of waiting? (laughs) Maranatha, come on, when are you coming? And I think what happens, because we don't like to wait, I don't like to wait, we kind of like, I got all of them. I'm just, I got better things to do. And then the third reason I think people aren't compelled to eternal things is we like our things, our cars, our cigars, our iPhones, our Netflix shows, our noise, our nose rings, our diamond ring. We like ice cream. We want things now. Give it to me now. I call this the, if you've been around this church a while, the circus peanut curse. I, I made a terrible mistake telling people I love circus peanuts. Oh, my gosh. Do you know what circus peanuts are, those orange marshmallow things? They're kind of like uh, marshmallow chicks you get on Easter, you know? You eat one, oh, they're really good. But the problem with, the problem with those circus peanuts is you eat one, and they have a, I think they got something in them that make you eat three, four, ten. But then when you eat about ten, they turn into cement, and they lodge in your stomach. And you don't want to eat anything else. A steak dinner comes by, and oh, I just ate a bag of circus peanuts. That's what we do with life. We get so involved in little trinkets like cars and cigars and our bin shows that we are so full on nothing that we don't have time for the thing. So why is eternal life so compelling? Well, it's in the name. Eternal, which means duration. That's a long time. That's a long time. Eternal is all about long-term investment. Am I willing to trade short-term thrill for long-term investment? 
It's all about long-term investment. I once heard somebody explain eternity like this. Still blows my mind. He says, you imagine you got this bird. He can fly to the moon. He goes to the beach, grabs the sand, piece of sand, one piece of sand, goes to the moon, drops it all. Comes back, gets another piece of sand, and drops it all. And then he has to go to every beach on the earth, every sand dune on the earth, every desert on the earth, and grab a grain of sand and go back to the moon. When he's finally done with that, that's just a wink in eternity. That's a long time. And God wants us to be with him forever. But also the second thing is the word life. Life is all about delight. Actually in Psalm 16 says, there are delights or pleasures at my right hand forever. This is eternal life. This is God's life. This is Zoe life. And the question is what really satisfies? Does cars, cigars, iPhone, Netflix shows, noise, nose rings, and circus peanuts really satisfy? No. King Solomon, book of Ecclesiastes, he tried everything. And at the end of it all, he said, he says this, no matter how much we see, no matter how much we hear, we are not content. It's Ecclesiastes 1.8. There's a researcher, he's a French sociologist, he says how the top 1% of wage earners are the most discontent because he says the more one has, the more one wants. And since satisfactions received only stimulate instead of fulfilling. So the more I have, it doesn't make me happy. It actually drives me to want more. It's a weird thing about humanity. We're never satisfied. So you could say worldly pleasures don't fulfill. They just fill, but we are cracked, so they run, we run empty. But eternal life, real life, is thick. It's satisfying. It's substantial. And so my question, even when I came here, how do I convince the average person that eternal life is a superior quality of life and it's something you want to chase, something more exciting than getting an egg with chocolate in it? Well, Paul says this. He goes, I, I consider in Romans 8 that all the sufferings I ever go through in life are not going to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us in heaven. So he compares it based, whatever you've suffered, I have a sister that has Rett syndrome, she's 61 years old, and for most of her life she's had the mind of a three-month-old baby. She has had to have her diapers changed, my mom feeds her every day, she rocks back and forth, she's lost most of her teeth, she's been in pain most of her life. I believe what God is saying, that heaven is going to swallow your suffering, reverse it, and make it worthwhile. Paul says it's going to be far superior. What? Either that's true or that's not not true. C.S. Lewis says, you can look at it like this, the life of God is trying to convince, imagine a kid's in your backyard and he's making mud pies, he's about two years old, and he's making these little mud pies, and he said, come on, Johnny, we're going to go to the beach, and he's never seen the ocean before. How do you convince him that going to the ocean and making sandcastles is a lot better than being in the backyard making mud mud pies? We're so stuck on our mud pies. We're so stuck on our cars and cigars and short thrills that we can't conceive of what God has for us. P.S. Lewis says we are far too easily content. Where I was thinking even about my son playing sports, I thought flag football was fun to watch. And then they did rocket football. Oh, that's a higher level. Then 78ers. Oh, that's real good football. Then freshman football. Then JV football. Whoa, it just increases. Then you get varsity football. Then you go to college football. Whole whole different ball game. And they're still not that good. (laughs) Heaven is above that in thrill. So I was talking to uh, Trevor and Will about, about this idea and um, thinking about actually my dad and those who lost dads, and we were talking about Hatcher getting baptized, Hatcher Lindsley, and he just lost his dad who's been a friend to a lot of people in here, a lot of people. And here's what I asked Will. I said, Will, 
what do you think Hatcher would give to just be with his dad again? Will said, oh, he'd give everything to be with his dad again. I would give everything just to be with my dad again. There's something about presence of a person and the the being with that person, that's so much better than things. And then Trevor said something fascinating. He said, but think of it like this, Chris. He goes, every good thing that Hatcher's dad and the things that Hatcher likes about his dad, or Chris, everything you like about your dad is merely a reflection of the goodness of God, like a tiny reflection of the goodness of God. So the God who gives us everything that we enjoy and we like and we love is heaven. It's him. John 17, 3 says, Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. And I want that. I want that bad. Which leads us to the second question. Admittance. How do I get in? In this egg, I have, I don't know if, what you guys think of Jordan Peterson, but I got to see him about a month ago, and they gave me this cool pass, man. VIP. I get to go backstage. I get to be admitted into his presence and talk to him. I shook his hand. He's a really nice guy. He's a nice guy. But the question is, who gets in? Who gets in? This is a huge question. Knee-jerk reaction, people would say, oh, only the good people get in. Only good people. Well, who are good people? You know, that's the question, who's invited? Only the good people. Who are the good people? And there's three R's, we often say, for the good people. The religious people, you know, the churchgoer, the tie wearer, the right denomination, I tithe on Sunday. I get in because I'm a good religious person. Or the right race. Sure, the Jews get in, they're the chosen people, but the Americans, not with the A, M-E-R, Americans. Americans get in the right kind of people. Or the righteous people, and the way we define righteous on what I'd say on a colloquial level is this way. The person who's done more good than bad, they get in. In other words, anyone but Adolf Hitler, for some, anyone but Joe Biden, for others, anyone but Donald Trump, for some, anyone but P. Diddy. P. Diddy's not getting in. (laughs) But who does John say? John says, everyone... With a little caveat, I'll explain in a second. Everyone is invited. Everyone. Acts 10.34 says God does not play favorites. He's no respecter of persons. Meaning, everyone includes the red-headed stepchild who was abandoned by his mom at the clinic. They're invited. The recovering alcoholic who went on a weekend binge because the NCAA tournament's back on again. You know, they're invited. The girl with the dragon tattoo who follows Dylan Mulvaney on Instagram. They're invited. The quiet person who sits in the back row who believes no one knows they even exist. They're invited. That brilliant atheist who's beginning to doubt even his unbelief. They're really invited. Even, you won't believe this, even Michigan fans are invited. I, I'm, I, <laughs> I'm sorry. I had to throw that in there. I got, always got to take that jab. I'm from Ohio, if you don't know. <laughs> Anyhow, the matter is this. God loves all people. In fact, he died for everyone's sin, including yours. You're invited But the caveat is this, you you have to respond to the invitation. You got, everybody's invited, but you got to respond to the invitation. That's the condition, is to respond. The invitation's for everyone, but only those who accept the invitation get in. I can't tell you how many people, if you say, hey, you want this egg? Nah, I've got better options. You do? Nah, it just seems beneath me. I'm kind of too good for it. I'm kind of cool. My life's fine. Nah, it's just dull. (laughs) It seems so boring. I don't want that. I got the life. 
So they don't accept it because they don't think it's worth it. But yeah, I, I, I want it. What's the price of admission, which is the third item? How much is it? What's the entrance fee? Is it a fancy $2 bill? What, what does it cost to get in? What does it cost to get in? That's what everyone wants to know. What do I have to do to gain access? In John 6.40, so the question is, what do I have to do to gain access? In John 6.40, it gives you two words. It's incredible. Looks to. And everyone who looks to. What in the world does that mean? Let me kind of give you a little bit of background. I'll set this up. A long, long time ago, God's people were wandering in the desert. They were getting frustrated with God. They were tired of being wandered, wanderers. And according to Numbers 21, 4 to 9, it says they began to mumble, complain, and whine, and they even curse God. They are mad at him. They were spoiled little brats. So God sent slithering snakes into their camp, venomous snakes. And those snakes started biting people, and people started dying because they were being bit by the snake. They ran to Moses for help. Moses prayed, and God told him to make a bronze snake and put it on a pole. Take a bronze snake, place it high, put it on a pole. Why? Because here's what he said. This is where it gets interesting. When anyone was bitten, and they looked at the bronze snake, they would be healed. When they looked up at the bronze snake, when they looked to the bronze snake, they would be healed. So the phrase looks to means three things. It admits that I need help. I cannot heal myself. I can't do it. Second thing, it says I believe in God's promise. He's good. He will heal me. And the third thing is, I'm not going to whine and complain. I'm going to change my life. I'll stop rebelling against God. I'll be his. That's what's implied by the phrase, looks to. I need help. I trust God. I'm done with my old life. It's called repentance, turning. According to John 6, verse 40, Jesus now is the one we are to look to. He has been bitten by sin for us. He became sin for us. So in a way, his bloody body is just like that rotten snake. He's he's basically illustrating what we've done. So he says, anyone who looks to the Son will have everlasting life. So he was lifted high up on a pole, up on a cross, so that no one would mistake it. It was obvious. He wants us to look to the cross. This is the real gift. That is the real answer. It's the entrance fee paid by Jesus for you. The Father's one and only Son paid the fee for you. And so by looking, it means, number one, I admit I need help. I have sinned. That's what that means. Number two, I believe God is a good Father. And through His Son, He's already taken care of my sin. And number three, I will change. I will change. I want to live for Him. If sin killed his son, why would I want to continue in it? That's really the question. Sin is the serpent's lie, and it brought death. Which brings us to the last item. I just have two pictures in this egg. This is a picture of my dad, full of life. He died about 16 years ago. This is my friend Phil Potter, full of life. This guy was a hillbilly, if you can tell by that picture. And he loved being a hillbilly. Remember, he owned that variety store in Grant. He'd always have these specials. Come on, get the special. He's dead. 
what hope do they have? So, so the fourth question is, what do we do about this thing called death? These lives are snuffed out. Where's Mark Lindsley? I mean, everything I say is all nice and good, but if this is it, it's not worth anything. And this is where John 640 brings us the most hope. I will raise them up on the last day, and that's called resurrection. Resurrection means this dead body is going to be breathed into new life again, restored brand new and made better than ever before. And as a lot of Kent City farmers know, you plant a dead seed, but that seed you plant comes up better than it ever was before. That's the idea of resurrection. My dad, Phil Potter, they're not going to be this full of the same crumbly clay that can die. They're going to be immortal. Immortal. And this is going to happen on the last day. I wrote down, this is called resurrection. Don Weeks, Phil Potter, Mark Lindsley, Charlene Winnell, Dave Harrison, Larry Skyden, but Bob Mortensen are not gone. In fact, they're waiting to be raised on the last day. How many of you earlier this week watched the barge plow into that single pylon and the bridge collapsed? <laughs> that single pylon held up the whole bridge. Resurrection is the single pylon that holds up the whole structure of Christianity. If we don't rise from the dead, this is stupid. But Christ indeed has been raised from the dead. He's the first fruits. That means he's the first offering. It's kind of like, let's say, have a whole wheat field. In the Jewish time, they would take a Take, take a, a sith and take a little bit of thing and wave it in the air, and it's called the first fruits. This is the beginning of the harvest. Jesus rose from the dead on this day out of the grave to say, look, he rose from the dead, and so will those who believe in him. That's why we, re we rejoice, because we know we're going to be risen again. This isn't it, man. <laughs> That's not it. He's going to be brought back to life. I have one more story. It's about little Philip. Little Philip was a, a boy, true story of a boy born with Down syndrome. He attended a third grade Sunday school class, and he had several other eight-year-old boys and girls in his class. Typical of that age, the children didn't really accept Philip because he had all those differences. He's a little special. They didn't know how to relate to him. But because of the teacher, they tried, she tried to get them to accept Philip. The Sunday after Easter, a teacher brought in a plastic Easter egg. Each kid was given one of those plastic Easter eggs. The children were told to go outside on that lovely spring day, find some symbol for new life, and put it in the egg. Back in the classroom, they would share their new life symbols, opening the containers one by one in surprise fashion. After running about the church property in wild confusion, the students returned to the classroom and placed the containers on the table. Surrounded by the children, a teacher began to open them up one by one. After each one, one had a butterfly, one had a leaf, one had a dandelion. The class would go, ooh, wow, how pretty. Then one was opened, revealing there was nothing inside the egg. Nothing. The children exclaimed, that's stupid. That's not fair. Somebody didn't do their assignment. Little Philip spoke up, said, that was my egg. Philip, you never do things right, one student retorted. There's nothing in there. He said, I did so do it. I did do it. It's empty because the tomb is empty. Silence followed. From then on, Philip became a full member of the class. He died not long afterwards from an infection most normal children would have shrugged off. At the funeral, this same class of eight-year-olds marched up to the altar with no flowers to lay an empty egg on his coffin as a sign of hope. To end this sermon, if I can put this back together. 
this empty, I can do, this empty egg is for you. All you got to do is accept it by faith, look up to the sun, and you will have everlasting life. It's that good.